This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the weekly meeting. I want to advise members that the committee meeting, which are recorded and broadcast through Parliament buildings and uh, online, members are welcome to use mobile devices so long as they're in airplane mode and uh, are muted. Uh, we don't have any apologies. We have a full house today. Uh, no, item number two on the agenda is chairperson's business. I want to advise members that myself and Philip uh, met informally for a roundtable discussion with members of the BEIS committee and other devolved administrations on Monday to discuss net zero and UN climate summits. I know that the meeting will be made available to members uh, in due course. Uh, item number three, uh, the uh, draft minutes. The draft minutes from the meeting of 11th of March are at page six. Can I seek agreement for those minutes? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, sign those. And obviously, we're not in Parliament buildings today, but I'll sign them uh, whenever we're back again, possibly next week, uh, if I'm up. Okay. Number four, there's matters arising. There's no matters arising. Item five in the agenda is departmental oral, oral evidence, the uh, climate change bill consultation and policy proposals. I want to refer members to the memo from the clerk at page 282, papers from the department at 289, summary of stakeholder responses at 379, and the paper from the research and information services at no, uh, page 400. And I want to welcome by Starleaf, Colin Green, uh, Director of Environmental Policy Division, Arlene McGowan, Grade 7 Climate Change Branch, and Anthony Courtney, Grade 7 uh, Climate Change Branch. And I'd like to invite the officials to uh, brief the committee, and then members will want to ask some questions thereafter. So, okay. Members, if you could just wait a few minutes, because we're actually ahead of time, not all the officials are actually in okay. So while we're waiting, we might want to just... Um, Jump ahead and do correspondence. Yeah. Okay. Okay, members. Uh, okay, we're going to just do correspondence, which is actually item ten on your agenda today. Correspondence is page four hundred and eighty-one. I want to draw members' attention to the following correspondence from the Department of Page nine hundred and ninety-three on the UK Emissions Trading Scheme twenty twenty-one review of free allowances call for evidence. The Department has requested that this draft should not be published until the intended publication date of the call for evidence on 17th of March. This was yesterday. This is because the publication is seeking views from stakeholders and it would not be appropriate that this should enter the public domain prior to official publication in order to ensure that affected stakeholders have an equal period of time in which to provide comment. Correspondence from Hospitality Ulster at page 1 038 on a hospitality recovery plan and a request to meet the committee to discuss. Members will wish to note that the economy committee has also received this request and will be meeting the hospitality with Ulster, hospitality Ulster. Members are content that we write back to advise this issue falls on the remit of a, the economy committee and due to time constraints in a full board work program, we are unable to fa facilitate the briefing at this time. Okay. Uh, correspondence from the department at 1000, page 1055, which is a follow-up to the queries raised at the meeting on the 25th of February on the abolishment of the Agriculture uh, Board. I understand that John, John, you want to uh, speak on this issue? John Blair? John? All right, that's on the Agricultural Board. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. John, yes. No, I think it's okay. I've reviewed the um, ministerial replies previously on this and I've taken it up separately with those who have contacted me. I'm content with that. I would like to refer to the correspondence on the uh, gas caverns, though, when you're yes. ready for that, if you don't mind. Oh, that's okay, yeah. So the correspondence to the department, that, that's in relation to... Um, Okay, we content to note the correspondence and uh, sorry, correspondence in the department at page 1058, which was a follow up to the issues raised at the meeting on the 28th of January. Are members okay to note this? Yeah. Okay, so correspondence from a member of the public regarding the Island McGee gas storage marine construction license at page 1028. John, you want to speak on that? Please, uh, Chair, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. I just want to be clear what we propose to say to the department when we write to them. Um, I would be firmly of the opinion that this is a cross-cutting issue. The major, mm -hmm. envi major environmental impact goes without saying. Economy impact um, also, obviously, uh, and a cross-cutting issue there. 
and there could be infrastructure uh, implications as well, of course. And for that reason, for those reasons and others, I think that uh, the the matter should go to the executive, as it's so clearly a cross cutting issue. And I'm hopeful that in correspondence from the committee to to the department to the minister, we can reflect those views. Okay, um, uh, members, okay with that with John's view, yeah. Okay, so. Um, are members content to action correspondence suggested on the index sheet of page 467? Okay. Um, forward work program. I wonder if I remember the forward work program, the draft program at page 1131. One of these members of the PSNA, PSNA has now confirmed its attendance, attendance at the meeting on the 15th of April rather than the 25th of March in relation to the committee investigation on security concerns at the porch. Um, are members okay with the forward? Can I seek agreement on the forward work, work program? Yeah. Okay with that? Okay. Um, you can okay go back that. to the agenda item on, on climate change. Yes. As, as the officials, uh, are, are the officials now uh, on standby, Stella? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, Colin, Arlene, and Anthony, uh, you are very welcome here this morning. So if you want to take the opportunity to brief the committee. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, they're not all in yet. Sorry, I thought they were all in yet. They're not all in yet. Can we take a five minute um, deferral for five minutes? Yeah, okay. Right, sure, just one quick thing here on the back to the Ellen McGee issue. Uh, yes. I, I don't know the, the answer to this. That's why I'm asking. Is there is there a live planning application there on this matter? I just don't know. Maybe we could establish that as well, could we? John, do you have any shed light on that? John, you're muted. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm assuming that yes, there would be. I, I don't have the information in front of me, but uh, again, would be another example of cross cutting if that was the case. And oh yes, I was doing that in support of of what you were yeah, what you yeah. were earlier there, John. There are tr tr tremendous number. Not to raise a good point there. Um, tremendous number of aspects of this, and uh, all of them need to be clarified. Aye. But as well, our report of call, um, I think it's fair to assume, has to be to, to DERA and to the Minister to, to clarify the path that they should be following on it in terms of those cross-cutting um, aspects. Aye. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Stella, are we still, um, are we still uh, broadcasting? Yes, we are. You maybe just want to ask broadcasting to take you out into closed session for five minutes while yeah, I'm just up these um, these officials. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Bro this is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room Twenty Nine. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room Twenty Nine. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room session now. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much.
Yeah. So uh, who, who have we got with us? Colin. Colin, thanks very much uh, for, for joining us here. I, w- I would like if you could take the opportunity, Colin, to, to brief us on the, the uh, climate change bill consultation of policy proposals. Yep, yep, thank you. Um, good morning, Chair. Good morning, members of the committee. Um, thanks for the opportunity to appear before you today. And thanks, uh, Colin. To- say, Colin, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us a bit earlier um, as well. You know, thanks very much out there. You're only from a short notice that you were to come a bit earlier than usual. So thank you very much for that. So go ahead, Colin. I got, thank you. I got my bit of toast in me very quickly and ready to go. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, uh, for, firstly, I'd just like to say I'm very happy that I'm going to be able to give you a much more substantial update than when I last appeared. So, um, I'll begin by providing some information on the responses to the discussion document on the proposed climate change bill. Uh, I touched upon it in February, but um, I can give you something more detailed today. And I'll also brief you on the draft policy proposals for Northern Ireland's very first climate change bill, which will soon be tabled at the executive. Uh, to seek agreement um, to allow us to formally instruct First Legislative Council. Uh, the aim for us remains for the bill to achieve its legislative passage within this mandate to ensure we meet the new decade, new approach commitments. I think most notably a climate change act which gives environmental targets a strong legal underpinning. So we all understand that Northern Ireland must do its bit to tackle climate change and our emissions must be significantly reduced. Therefore, any climate change legislation must set out a legally binding framework to reduce those emissions to an ambitious, achievable and acceptable level in a timely manner. But it must also complement Northern Ireland's ongoing climate change requirements under the legislation which currently exists in the form of the UK Climate Change Act 2008. So onto the consultation, it closed on the 1st of February and we worked at pace with NISRA to provide a stage one quantitative analysis of the consultation, which we have provided to you. Um, And there is a second stage ongoing and that is for us to develop a qualitative data analysis and that's currently been undertaken but isn't yet complete. So we, we took the decision that due to the importance of introducing the bill within the current mandate, it wasn't feasible to complete the full analysis before briefing yourselves. However, you know we have looked at the responses and we plan to provide a much more detailed update, update to yourselves at a later date. So in terms of stage one analysis, uh, we received 269 discrete responses with quantitative information. Uh, 48% of those respondents wanted a bill which requires Northern Ireland to contribute fairly to the UK net zero target by 2050. This was the preferred option. 39.8% of respondents wanted a bill which would require NI to have net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and 123 Three percent said they didn't know or they weren't sure which they preferred. Uh, another point of note is that 83% of respondents want flexibility built into the bill to allow consideration of updates to evidence, science and understanding of climate change. 87% of respondents want a provision in the bill for public bodies to report on adaptation to climate change. And 77% of respondents want the bill to include provision for an independent Northern Ireland advisory body on climate change. Uh, So, as I mentioned previously, we have done some analysis of the qualitative data just to ensure we aren't missing anything major. Uh, So, the early analysis identified four top themes which were brought forward by around 100 or more respondents. And these four themes were the need for reporting from public bodies, the need for an independent advisory body, a net zero target by 2050, and a need for reporting from non-public bodies. Uh, I won't go into more detail on these just now, but I can provide more detail during the questioning if anything is of particular interest. So moving on to outline the draft policy proposals, which Minister Poots will shortly be seeking executive agreement on, and which I am also seeking your opinion on today, and hopefully your endorsement of today. These proposals have been informed by the Climate Change Committee's expert advice. A detailed legislative review, which my team and I undertook to identify the main uh, essential elements of effective climate change legislation. So we looked at legislation from around the UK, Scotland, Wales, Republic of Ireland, and a whole range of other countries around the world. And uh, and we also took into account the findings so far from the consultation, which uh, has led us to 
come up with the following policy proposals and agree those with Minister Poots. So the first aspect of the bill will concern emissions reduction targets. And it is proposed to include a headline long-term net greenhouse gas emissions target to 2050 to be set at least 82% lower from 1990 levels, with further interim reduction targets of 48% lower by 2030 and 69% lower by 2040. These are in line with the CCC advice and with the outcome of the stage one analysis of the consultation. Now, um, I fully appreciate that some may question our level of ambition in terms of these proposed targets, but in order to help explain it, I wanted to use the analogy of an Olympic high jump competitor. So they will set the bar at a level which is challenging, but is based on their track record, their experience, and on all of the data they have available on their performance. If the bar is set much too high, they will simply run up to it and spectacularly sail under it. Um, it's, that would be a very def deflating experience, no doubt. But of course, as the competitor improves, they can raise that bar and strive for ever higher goals. Just like that competitor, we are using the up-to-date and relevant information and analysis of what is realistically achievable for Northern Ireland to set the emissions target bar at the right level so that we can truly stretch ourselves, but also so that we can aim for credible achievements. Just as in my analogy, as we continue to progress, we can continually review and update these targets. In my own experience, I would say it's important to ensure the targets are not just ambitious, but also realistic to get maximum buy-in from everyone. Uh, unachievable targets can often have the opposite effect to the, that which we are aiming for and demotivate or lead to a feeling of, you know, it is impossible, so why even bother trying? Uh, I would really aim to avoid this if possible. The other aspects of the bill that are being proposed are setting of five yearly carbon budgets, which would set a cap on greenhouse gas emissions for Northern Ireland for each of those five year periods. And then minimum reporting requirements, including carbon budget implementation reports, which would lay out what we will do to meet a budget, final carbon budget statement reports, which lay out how well we met our completed budget, statements for interim target years and the long-term 2050 target, and shortfall reports, which would lay out how we would address any shortfalls if we were to fail in meeting a budget. Uh, so there would also be a requirement to carry out interim and end of program progress reporting to the Assembly on carbon budgets, a requirement to obtain independent but non-binding non review of progress on meeting emission reduction targets, carbon budgets and implementation of ad adaptation programs, which will supplement the adaptation reporting requirements which are already exist in the UK Climate Change Act. These uh, are suggested to be at a frequency of end of term progress reviews for carbon budgets and in term progress reviews for adaptation programs. And finally, we have also proposed to include enabling provisions to give powers through secondary legislation to require climate change reporting by public bodies. Again, this is something I can explain in more detail during the questioning. And just before I close, I wanted to give a few final thoughts of my own. Uh, so the most recent Northern Ireland greenhouse gas projections update highlighted that while emissions are projected to decrease year on year in Northern Ireland until 2025, at which time they're projected to level off, the report states that the downward trend is mainly driven by the energy supply sector, with Kilroot Power Station closing in 2023, contributing to the de decrease between 2019 and 2024, before levelling off as no further policy savings are available. And it also states that a lack of policy direction in the later years of the projections results in a decline in the decrease, causing greenhouse gas emissions to level off. These projections estimate that we would meet the original CCC's target of 39% emissions reductions by 2030 for Northern Ireland. However, the latest CC advice and our bill proposals say that we should aim for at least 48% reduction by 2030. So currently with those projections, we're not going to meet that. So furthermore, the CCC have said that to meet the challenging 2040 and 2050 targets, policy needs to be developed and implemented now in the, throughout the 2030s and early 20, or, or throughout the 2020s, sorry, and early 2030s, um, and any levelling off at this stage could have major long-term consequences. So this is another reason why a bill is crucial within this mandate, to give a strong focus on targets and to put in place a legal framework for action upon which policymakers can build. 
I feel it is worth outlining to yourselves that should the bill not complete legislative passage within this mandate, one of the most likely scenarios for risk of failure in my assessment would be that we would be aiming to include a whole range of extra policy provisions within this primary legislation to help deliver particular policy objectives, but which would not be essential for effective climate change legislation. And if this were indeed the case, I would estimate a climate change bill is unlikely before 2026, which I certainly don't want to think about. Um, I am basing this on the likelihood there would need to be engagement with so many parties to see what extra policy areas would be preferred by them to be included in this much wider bill. This would have to be followed then by a further consultation process, a commencement of a new development process, and then the legislative passage for this new bill. And just my fi very final thought, the Green Alliance have recently said in relation to climate change that failure is not an option. And I feel very similarly about this bill. So me and my team have been working long hours to try and deliver this, but it needs the support of this committee, the executive and the assembly to make it a reality. For that reason, I hope you can endorse the policy proposals for the bill. Um, so thank you and ready for your questions. Um, thank you for that, uh, Colin. And we, we do have a number of members who do want to ask questions. Um, I will say that um, we, uh, we, we, had a, we had a very interesting exchange with the CCC a number of weeks ago. Um, both myself and Philip, the Deputy Chair, we had a, a very good exchange with the BEIS Committee uh, last week, or sorry, this week as well, in relation to the COP26 and the, whole, um, the UN Climate Summit. Um, I, I will make the point that I, I think that it's that that it's, it's, we do need this legislation because apart from our, obviously our, commi our commitments to you know, the climate change agenda, I think the fact that we're the only region on these two islands that doesn't have a Climate Change Act is, is sending out the wrong message, so it is. And it would be, um, it would be it's wrong that we send a message out to the rest of the world that we aren't a region that's committed to sustainable practices, particularly in areas like agriculture. Uh, whenever, whenever in actual fact, we are world beating uh, when, when it comes to um, uh, the food we produce and our practices. Um, but I did make the, the point whenever we met the BEIS um, the other day as well, is that given the fact that we are um, a very strong food producing region, we, we produce enough food for over 10 million people. Whereas Britain is not self-sufficient, it's only 58% self-sufficient. I think it's um, important that in terms of any uh, legislation coming in, that there is uh, a, just, a just transition so that, uh, so say for example, our food producers or our food producers uh, are supported and facilitated uh, to make this tr transition. And also a recognition that uh, a lot of the emissions produced by um, the uh, farming community, they uh, they're circular. You know, there's there, there's a there's a balance between what is produced and what is sequestered, and uh, and that's important. That the um, given the fact that uh, our farmers um, maintain the landscape and our bog lands and our peatlands and our carbon sinks, that that's factored in whenever we are working out these targets. So, I do think the Climate Change Act is is vitally important because I think if we don't have it. I think that other countries around the world globally will judge us on that benchmark and they could vote with their feet uh, by by the fact that we haven't got this here. I think it, will, it is a global, it will be a global uh, benchmark. It is a global benchmark and I think it's important to go down the road. But it's really important that the, the department and uh, the governments here in this island, across from Britain, uh, enables and supports that just transition as well, Colin. Yes, um, thanks very much, Chair. Yeah, I think uh, I think you know, we, you know, we really do want to lead by example. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it's any shock that we we don't have a climate change act, and in the UK we are the you know the worst performers so far in terms of reducing emissions. Uh, I think to quote my permanent secretary from a meeting I was at recently with him, uh, we don't want to be left behind. You know, we are doing lots of the right things, but we want to be showing that we're doing lots of the right things. So this this legislation will help us not do that. Uh, in terms of just transition, I completely agree, and the CCC have recognised that. And I have to say, I really welcome their advice in recognising that, that you know, recognising the good work that Northern Ireland do in terms of agri-food production, and not, uh, you know, not attacking 
that uh, not saying right you need to get to net zero at all costs and they, they you know they made it quite clear in their letter and minister puts done a follow-up letter that in order to achieve net zero what we'd be doing is simply moving that food production elsewhere which doesn't make a lot of sense when we do it so well um i think really i, I think the in terms of the emissions balance yeah we we, we need to do more to sequester carbon and uh, the agricultural land and land use policy in general is probably the best way to do that at the minute. So yeah, I fully recognise all those points and would agree with every one of them. Thank you, Colin. Uh, okay, I'm going to move around the room. Uh, Philip, you're first to end the case. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, uh, I like your high jump, uh, Olympic high jump analogy, Colin, but I mean, uh, if sport was predictable, you know, there would be no point to it. And over the years, whether it's at the Olympics or World Cups or uh, all Ireland, you know, it, there is unpredictability and many teams that were unfancied were able to achieve great, great success with hard work. I mean, I, I do think that there's a, a lack of ambition uh, in this. And I mean, I want to start off by making the comment that I actually think some of the questions in the consultation were probably deliberately misleading in terms of framing things, particularly uh, with uh, expert advice and non-expert advice. You know, there, there are other organizations and groups out there uh, that opinions and advice uh, as equally as expert as the CCC uh, who think that uh, achieving net zero for the North uh, by 2050, indeed by 2045, is uh, infinitely achievable. And in, fe in fact, the CCC uh, say in the report, there's no purely no technical reason why net zero is not possible. So I, mean, I do think that some of the questions were, uh, you know, like for example, long-term targeting does not uh, consider expert climate change advice and long-term target considers ex expert climate change advice w was put in the framing of some of the questions. So I think that was misleading. Uh, I want to make that point. Uh, just briefly, then, a few, couple of other points. Very little aspect of all island nature on this. I mean, I, I, th I don't think we can uh, work towards net zero or any kind of uh, carbon reduction uh, in the north without taking cognizance of the fa fact and reality that we, we live on an island. Uh, so there needs to be something more in that. In terms of the consultation responses, uh, I mean, there, I know there was a significant response to the consultation in, in the form of the Ulster Wildlife e-action and e-petition from members uh, in favour of a pub uh, or in favour of the bill with net zero target of 2045. So, I mean, can I just ask, because I, I, I couldn't see it in there, how many people supported this petition and e-active action respectively? And can you confirm if the majority of the respondents uh, and the consultation were in favour of net zero by 2045? Okay, so um, I suppose the the first thing you know, uh, I fully accept that uh, you know sport is unpredictable. I used the analogy. Uh, so really, it's it's the target in the bill is around uh, at least eighty two percent. So that that gives some level of realism. But the ambition, we're certainly not trying to limit the ambition to go much further. Um, and we also have many provisions within the bill that would allow us to update those targets as new advice comes in. But you know. I, I I picked the high jump in particular because you know if you're if you're doing a two meter high jump you're not going to suddenly do a three meter high jump, so you know, we need what what we thought was the right amount of uh, realism with ambition. So you know, at least eighty two percent doesn't stop anybody from going much further, much faster, uh, and I think it's around getting that balance between the two, and that's that's where we aim with that. So uh, in terms of the, the no purely technical reason, uh, I know Minister Put sent another letter on that. So while they say there's no purely technical reason, they do give a, a couple of pages of, of reasons of why it, you know, the, the main reasons being we would have to significantly reduce livestock numbers in Northern Ireland, um, which would have a major impact on the agri-food and the farming community. And it would also only serve to move that food production elsewhere. And the other reason was, you know, we could aim for net zero if significantly more of the carbon capture and storage technologies were 
moved to Northern Ireland, but they would be located in suboptimal areas if that was the case. It would be extra cost for no extra benefit for UK net zero. And I think, I suppose it's really the question of, you know, are we aiming for UK net zero or are we aiming for Northern Ireland net zero? And uh, as we're governed by the UK Climate Change Act, I think overall we're still aiming for UK net zero. It would be, you know, it, so it would be. It seems that uh, there are enough reasons there that we start at 82 percent. And I'm supposed to give the example of Wales. Wales did start at a lower level, and then as they began to progress, they realised that they could do more and have legislated for more. So there, there's nothing to stop us from doing the same. But I think it's important to get a realistic target and get the legislation in place. We are further behind than all of the other UK jurisdictions. So. We really do need to uh, um, break widely. Uh, you're cutting out there, Colin. You were. Oh, sorry. Um, wh where did you get me? Uh, it, was, it was just intermittent there for the last in the last minute or so. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't know why is it. Um, uh, let me see. So uh, I suppose what I was saying. Uh, I was talking about there was no purely technical reason, but the fact of the carbon capture and storage and the offshoring of agri-food production. Um, so did you get all of that? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I suppose the, the next thing is really talking about the the all-island nature. So there's nothing in the bill to exclude us from cooperating on an all-island basis, but it's, it's more about a global challenge and collaborating widely with everyone. So, uh, you know, we do collaborate through adaptation in around the British Irish Council, and we certainly won't uh, stop collaborating, but uh, it isn't something that would necessarily need to be legislated for. Uh, although, of course, you know, as it, you know, it's something that I'm quite happy to take the comments on board of. Uh, in terms of the Ulster wildlife responses to the consultation, it really was that, so, we did. We received. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers, and perhaps Arlene can dig them out while I'm talking, and then she can come in. But uh, as a standard practice with a campaign response, where people are largely just forwarding on an email uh, and not, you know, not putting in their own uh, thoughts or opinions, that's taken as a single campaign response. Uh, so uh, they they had. The, the, that was taken as one response, and it was basically that yeah, they wanted to go for net zero through the Ulster Wildlife Trust. But uh, I don't know if Arlene's on now, if she can give the, the figures of the number of Ulster Wildlife responses. Uh, yes, Colin, thank you. There was uh, 430 uh, responses from Ulster Wildlife um, that were all very similar. There were a standard email response. And, okay, and thank you. Martin has taken those four hundred and thirty as one response. Yeah, that's a, that's the, the the sort of standard way to avoid a consultation being skewed by you know a, a number of emails being sent from different people, all you know with one agenda. It would be the same no matter what the answer was, because it was quite clear they were all coming. You know, they were a standard email template. They're all coming in the form of the Ulster Wildlife Response. Uh, but they were all the majority of those uh, responses. I, I take it were in favour of net zero by twenty forty five. Uh, was it twenty forty five or twenty fifty? Arlene was the was it... twenty twenty fifty. Twenty okay. fifty. Mm. Okay. So I mean, that, that, if you add those four hundred and thirty to the figures, I mean that totally changes the the figures that have been presented this morning. But th th yeah, and that's why we wait consultation responses to you know to avoid a skewing of responses by a particularly active campaign and that's you know, that happens in many consultations I've been involved in both positively and negatively it's just uh, you know, it's 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 the way to inform good consultation otherwise you can have companies with vested interests not not that I'm saying it's in this case just paying people to respond with a similar email. You know, we've we've had it in other examples in waste, for example, where people don't want a particular outcome. So they will push lots of people or even, you know, lots of social media bots and things like that to just answer and keep answering and almost spam the consultation with one answer. 
uh, but it oh, doesn't. I, 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 sorry to interrupt, and I understand that, Colin. But I mean, given the importance of this, I mean, and and maybe in terms of promoting the consultation. No, can I ask? What kind of engagement the department did with the kind of local environmental sector or local policy experts and the climate community, you know, prior and during the consultation? Uh, I suppose, uh, Arlene, do you, do you want to come in on this one? Um, sorry, my um, my screen kind of uh, stalled there. Could, could I ask you, Philip, to repeat the question? I know. I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of taking up the point that, you know, the four, those 430 are, are deemed as one. And I'm kind of asking, you know, if that was the case, you know, was there much consultation done with sort of the environmental sector or policy groups uh, here in the north in terms of, you know, coming to a decision on, on net zero or 82% or even the time frame uh, in relation to that? Well, our, the consultation was circulated widely and um, through media platforms and was promoted um, through both our press office and my NI, et cetera. And um, there was also a press release statement by the minister. So we we that that was our avenue um, of engaging with folk across across Northern Ireland. Yeah, and I suppose I would add to that, Philip, that the, the, so a lot of the ENGOs would have attended the Climate Change Committee briefings that were in and around the same time as the consultation, and I did speak to a number of them personally, uh, just to discuss things, uh, not only the environmental sector, but much wider than that, uh, all sorts of sectors, anybody who wanted to talk about it, uh, to try and get the views of many. So uh, I think, you know, uh, there, there's certainly an, an ambition to go much further and be seen to be a leader. But I think we have to also take the fact that getting to 82% is by no means a cop out or by no means easy. Uh, it is still incredibly challenging. We have, you know, between 1990 and 2018, we've reduced by 20%. We have to reduce in the next 30 years by 82%. So we have a long way to go. Uh, as uh, evidence and science emerges, we can by all means, you know, up those targets. But I think I think it's important to realise the effect this will have. You know, we do, as uh, the chair had said, we do need a just transition. And this is the advice we've gotten for a just transition. Okay. Have enough, Philip? Philip, you're muted. I, I, I wouldn't say have enough, but I don't want to hug the meeting chair, so I'll allow you other. Okay. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Uh, uh, John? Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Colin and Arlene, also for, for presenting this to us today. Um, I want to pick up more broadly on this. Uh, issue of the challenges around reaching that 82%. So, so we can try and do that in, in stages um, and, and relate it to, to the policy proposals. Um, there's been thus far this morning a great emphasis on agriculture, and that's perfectly understandable given the figures that we know of, of uh, emissions contributions. But but I want to draw that out slightly uh, as well to to incorporate the department's overarching responsibility for environment as well. So if we start with, and I'll probably break this into two separate uh, questions, if you don't mind. Um, if we start with the policy proposals and the requirement for public bodies to report, how do we drill down further than that if we are to address those challenges? What what um, targeting will there be? What interaction will there be with business sector, small and large, with agricultural sector, small and large, for example, Northern Ireland has over 26,000 family family farms, um, I think supporting over 29,000 households, employing or supporting over 107,000 people. So I want to know how we drill down to individual contributors to the uh, problem, first of all. Um, if you could reflect on that, particularly relating to, to business and, and, and farms individually. Yeah, okay, thanks, John. Um, so I suppose I will start with agriculture and really, so there, there's obviously, there is obviously a challenge. The, the CCC have identified some things around just transition, but there needs to be, and also for businesses, there needs to be sectoral 
targets, which will be developed by departments. They're not form part of the legislation. And really, you know, plans of how each sector will reduce. Every sector needs to do their bit. No sector is getting a free run by any means. Uh, the you know, businesses, agriculture, waste, energy, transport, they all have to do an awful lot and an awful lot very quickly. So uh, one, one of the delivery vehicles will obviously be the green growth strategy. Um, that will look at different sectors and how we can reduce emissions while also still you know protecting the economy uh, in terms of businesses the there is already there are already some uh, responsibilities on them to report through uh, a, a company's order i believe um let me i do i actually have a note because because uh, I, I can never seem to remember exactly what the piece of legislation is. So, um, yeah, the, comp the Companies UK Act 2006 and relevant subordinate legislation uh, does mean that uh, companies have to have climate related financial disclosures. So that there is some onus on them already. We will also have uh, various engagement with businesses as part of behaviour change campaigns, uh, as part of information sharing. Uh, you know, obviously, some of the onus is on Department for Economy too to assist with that. Uh, so it's really it, it is really a cross departmental challenge to engage further. Uh, every single sector needs to do more, and it's up to all of us and the executive to ensure that more is done. But I suppose to get that journey started, we really need the legislation in place to really give that focus on these targets, John. Yeah, Colin, I, I'm getting that, but, but what I'm trying to, to achieve with, with the questions is um, a, a commitment to make that happen. The interdepartmental responsibility is very clear. Um, I look, for example, at the contributory figures from, from the transport sector or the residential sector, highlight, not that it's needed, but, but highlight if it were needed, the uh, interdepartmental responsibilities and and the problems that, that are across across sectors. So I go back to, should that not mean, therefore, that within the legislation, or at the very least within the policy proposals that we have at this stage, that there should be very specific targets for those individual sectors and those individual departments, so that it's all tied together to, to contribute to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, so I suppose the, the, the simple answer there is that the, your legislation around the world generally doesn't have sector-specific targets. You have an overall target so that the whole executive has to buy into that overall target. And then, you know, we work to develop exactly what the best path for that will be. Because A, we don't have the budget to do absolutely everything. And B, as, as things change, one sector can do more and maybe one sector uh, ends up doing less. So the, the whole aim is around getting this collective challenge really uh, embedded into Northern Ireland government, into Northern Ireland departments. Yeah. Then, to cut across you here, but just, just at that point of the responsibility of DERA to do absolutely everything, is that cross-departmental commitment not the, one of the mechanisms to try and address that budget? Uh, limitation issue because all departments and other sectors and their representative bodies, for example, could also be contributing to, to the budgetary requirements. Oh, yes, and, and they should be. So this won't be... Dear, essentially, the legislation will be have DARE as a coordination role, but certainly the onus and the sort of all of the ambition and all, all of the sort of need to meet targets will be placed equally on all Northern Ireland departments and so ultimately on the executive. It won't be placed on DARA to do everything. DARA will, uh, DARA obviously have their, in terms of waste and agriculture, are probably our two main sectors that we would have to develop the policy proposals for. But each and every department will have to develop policy proposals for their own areas and will have to work collectively to develop budgets and really start tackling this challenge. Uh, so I think I think the answer really is, oh, it's not, it, by no means is it DARE's challenge and it, it, by no means is it DARE's responsibility. The legislation's our responsibility. The developing of secondary regulations will be our coordinating responsibility. But meeting these targets is not a DARE responsibility and it won't, 
it be in the legislation as such. It will be very much on all Northern Ireland departments. That that's that's sort of a, a flavour of Northern Ireland legislation where it's placed on the departments, which ultimately rests with the minister for that department. Whereas in GB, it's usually the Scottish ministers or the Welsh ministers. It's just how legislation is written here, from what I'm told, but it will be equally on every one of the, the departments and the ministers. Okay, and, and finally, so that I'm clear, and I don't want to hog this either, but the, the intersectoral or interdepartmental responsibilities and issues can, can go back to, can, can it be built into the policy proposed at this stage that there will be advice available to, to uh, the various sectors and, and all business units or all individuals within those sectors, be that business or agriculture, so those people can be advised by departments, plural, on technologies available, advice that's available to, to reach those targets, because I think that needs to, to start to be built in at this stage. Um. I, I'm I'm not sure if that would be something you would necessarily legislate for, but you would that should obviously be part of any plan to m meet emissions reduction targets. You know, two of the big important factors in meeting any target are behaviour change and awareness raising. So you, you need to educate everybody on how they can do things. You know, uh, let's say taking uh, waste, for example, which is something that I have been involved in, you know, we need to educate people on how to recycle more. And, you know, we've run a lot of behaviour change campaigns and that has moved massive uh, increases in recycling over the last decade. And it's, it'll be the same with every other sector. It, it's just good practice as part of a department. I can't imagine any department would start on a plan to reduce emissions and not let people know what they're doing, how they can help and why they're doing things. So I think to answer you, John, it wouldn't necessarily be something we would put in the legislation because it's you know it, it would be very hard to define in legislative terms, but it's certainly something that would need to be done and I can't imagine any government department not doing so. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Colin Arden. Colin how will the bill drafted to these policy proposals compare with Climate Change Acts and GB? Or how do they compare also with the ROI? First of all, thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah. thank you very much, Harry. So, uh, as I said, we took, a very, we took a very detailed legislative review, and basically, all legislation worldwide would have four common provisions or four common aspects the main ones, targets, budgets reporting requirements and advisory body. So ours are having those, although the advisory body proposed is the Climate Change Committee. Uh, so it really, there there are various acts will also have all sorts of other hook on provisions that aren't really standard for any climate change legislation. They may do something in waste, for example, they may do something in land use, but that's really around just getting other things into primary legislation. We considered those but given the time frame and the need to get within this mandate, if you include one, where do you stop? And that's the, that's the basic question. So ours is a very focused bill on what is needed to operate climate change legislation. All the other policy proposals for DERA, for all the other departments, will need to be brought forward by us at pace as soon as this is enacted. Is there anything you find that has not been covered or left out in the proposals? Or do you feel you've been covered at all? No, I suppose I, I feel that uh, we have covered everything that's essential for well-functioning climate change legislation. Mm -hmm. In an ideal world, I would love this bill to be several hundred pages long, covering mm -hmm. every sector and you know dealing with all the land use issues, all the waste issues, all the other things, so we didn't have to develop lots of other pieces of primary legislation. But mm -hmm. balancing that against the fact that we need this legislation, the NDNA have committed to this legislation. We only have a year left in this mandate. So what we need was a focused piece of legislation to set a legally binding framework for climate change so that we can start really reducing our emissions for this major challenge. Mm -hmm. um, Colin, with all the proposals, how long will it, do you think it'll take to see the desired changes so we know what we're doing is worth it? I mean, I'm just wondering. 
Yeah, well, I suppose uh, once the legislation is enacted, uh, that's, uh, I would say already, you know, uh, dealing with uh, a number of cross-departmental groups and strategic oversight groups, a lot of departments are already working on climate action plans. But uh, as the last greenhouse gas projections said, you know, if we don't start getting policy directions or new policies in soon, we're going to level off very quickly. But if we can get this legislation in place, I can see major changes over the next few years if there's the will to do so. Yeah, and um, you would say, I mean, we can produce our present levels of agri foods, but being more innovative rather than cutting our, uh, our produce, yeah? Uh, well, I don't, I, I personally wouldn't like to sort of talk about the exact specifics of agriculture, other than to say what the CCC recommended in a just transition. You know, they, they did suggest, I think they briefed you on it, that there's a behaviour change element where less meat is being used. So possibly uh, some of the agri-food sector here moves to other crops, for example, or maybe land use for other things. But that, that, uh, that's really down to future agricultural policy. And the bill itself is really just setting what target would be sensible for that just transition. Still a lot of work needs to be done to decide on exactly how that will come about. But you know, we, we need to start somewhere and I think this is the first step of a very big journey. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you. Colin. Thank you, Harry. Yeah, I think that's an important point there, just to note, Colin. I think it's important that the future agriculture policy needs to uh, be very much aligned with the climate change because see for example I can Areas where I live here out in the hills, that there is there is very little alternative land uses other than um, grassland and heather that we have here. You know, so that's an important point, I think. Uh, Patsy, Patsy, thanks very much, Chair, and thank you, Colin, for that. I'd just be interested in picking up on some of the stuff that John was talking there about how individual government departments will set in place. Uh, um, if you like monitoring procedures and how that might work, or what what thoughts have you given to how that might uh, might be judged, and and how they how they measure it, and how they benchmark performance, and and uh, those types of issues. Uh, have you given any thought to that as to how that yes, might be well, rolled out departmentally? Oh yeah, well, I suppose we already have the monitoring and measuring in place through the greenhouse gas inventory, and that you know that focuses on sectors. So some of the some of those sectors obviously will cut across departments, uh, and and then in terms of looking at the the green growth strategy may also set sectoral specific targets. Although I suppose that that hasn't been decided yet. Uh, departmental climate action plans may also set uh, particular targets. But in terms of the monitoring and measuring itself, that's that's well established, Patsy. So uh, I have no concerns about monitoring and measuring. My concerns are about delivering. Yeah, just, just well, for me, just a, a relative, treat me as a blank sheet here, just how is that monitoring and measuring done then? Okay, so the statisticians uh, would measure the, the greenhouse gas emissions. So the most recent report was the 2018. Um, that uh, gives a, an indication, uh, some, some figures are modelled, of what the, the greenhouse gas emissions for Northern Ireland have been for a particular year, as I say, 2018, and then what that reduction has been against the baseline year, which is 1990, for a series of different greenhouse gases. So at the minute, as I say, we are at a 20% reduction compared to 1990 levels as at 2018. And just, I suppose, to give you some indication of where other jurisdictions are. Uh, so the UK as a whole have reduced emissions by 43% since 1990. England have done the best at a 46% reduction. Scotland, almost as good at 45% reduction. Wales are 31% reduction. And, you know, it's, I don't think it's any coincidence that they've all got well-functioning pieces of legislation. Um, Republic of Ireland's emissions have actually increased by 10% or slightly over 10% from 1990 levels, according to their 2019 figures. And so that's, that's where we are on a UK basis at the minute. Well, sorry, maybe that's the outcome. Uh, you're measuring the outcome. What I'm what I'm talking about is the mechanism put in place to establish how that's being done within each individual department. It's right. So, outcomes, it's how uh, and what measures have been individually taken within departments, or indeed their their arms length bodies, to to fulfil those outcomes. 
Oh, sorry, sorry, I misunderstood your question. Sorry, I apologise, oh. Patsy. So that will be a lot of that will be to do with the the carbon budget reporting, and I think Arlene's probably best place to explain how all the different reporting will work, okay. um, and then how the you know the executive, the committee, etc., will look at that. So Arlene, do you want to talk a little bit about the different reporting requirements that we have? I think you're on mute, Arlene. <laughs> Oh, have we lost Arlene? No. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Hi. Sorry about that. Um, yes. So the carbon budgets are five yearly uh, carbon budgets. Um, and within that, um, there will be um, like an interim monitoring stage. And the interim monitoring stage will look at... Um, how like it's like a halfway stage on how well we are delivering on our our policies and uh, you know our implementation reports for uh, our carbon budget um, and then um, as Colin related to uh, we'll use the greenhouse gas inventory uh, to then assess at the end of our carbon budget um, how how successful we have been in um, meeting our carbon budgets. And as Colin alluded to, um, the greenhouse gas inventory is, 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 is an inventory which is published every every year, but on a, it, it's two years behind. Um, the carbon budget, the greenhouse gas inventory is actually um, produced annually by Ricardo Energy Environment. It's on behalf of Scottish Government, uh, the UK, and um, DERA on behalf of all other departments, uh, basically contains data detail detailing greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 to the latest reporting year, which I uh, have said takes, uh, which is two years behind any present year. So it's basically like a subset of the UK greenhouse gas inventory, and it's produced to fulfil um, for example, the United Nations Convention on Climate Change reporting requirements and under the, and uh, under the the Kyoto Protocol, um, it, it's basically compiled in line with international guidance. Um, and they look at different uh, greenhouse gases, seven altogether, which includes methane, carbon dioxide, etc. Oh, um, sorry, Arlene. Um, sorry, uh, uh, Patsy was actually looking for an explanation of the uh, the, the reporting within the bill. Oh, within the so uh, I, I I have it here now, Patsy. Um, so I'll so we will have uh, various types of reports which will have to be laid in the assembly, and Arlene can correct me if I'm wrong in any of these. So there there will be a implementation report, a progress report on how we're reducing emissions for that carbon budget, and a final closing statement to say if we've met that budget. If uh, we haven't, then there will have to be a shortfall report. So I think there'll be quite a, a clear focus on meeting those carbon budgets and a clear focus on any sector which hasn't. And the sector that haven't then, and of course, the, the department responsible or the departments responsible will have to actually explain why those weren't met and then create another report to say what they're going to do in order to meet that shortfall in the next carbon budget period. So there's a strong emphasis on reporting and I think really it shines a spotlight on what we are doing well and if there's anybody not doing well it will equally shine a spotlight on on that in terms of you know how are you going to do more it, it gives that sort of impetus and drive to do a bit more in terms of actually meeting these carbon budgets when you have to report and say whether you have or haven't and similarly there will be reports around the emissions reduction targets so for the interim years of 2030 and 2040 and 2050, we have to report on whether we have met those targets. And if we haven't, why not? And I believe also that would be a good stage to look at whether we can be more ambitious in the targets. Um, and I think the, the other, we already report on our, a, a number of bodies already report in terms of our number of departments ready to report in terms of climate change adaptation programs. So the legislation adds to that by having a sort of midterm reporting for that. So it's not just you've got to the end of your term, how have you done? And is there anything else I have left out in terms of reporting, Arlene? 
Um, I don't know whether you want to touch on um, that we will be um, also asking or we will also be required for independent review of progress reporting and that, that that would be a role which would fall to the CCC. Um, so there is an element, obviously there's self within government reporting, but there's also an, an element of, of in, independent review of progress, both of uh, carbon budgets and also the implementation of our adaptation programs, which is supplementary to what uh, reporting, which is already required under the UK Climate Change Act for adaptation reporting. Thanks, Arlene. Does th any just, other uh, questions? Yeah, just specifically on the, just want to nail this down, Colin. Is the is the onus on individual departments to do this, or is ERA the one lead department that kickstarts other departments to do this? So the, 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 the responsibility lies equally on all Northern Ireland departments, okay. uh, which will, will ultimately rest with the executive. DERA would obviously be the coordinating department for this because you know, of our role, but the mm -hmm. responsibility lies equally on everybody and you know the, the reports would be provided by everyone. And that's that's where the legislation is really needed to ensure collaboration and to ensure you know everybody complies with the legislation. It's a very strong driver. Yeah. Okay. Can I just jump in there? If, sorry, sorry, Arlene. Um, no, I was just going to just add to that. Um, it's at the stage of the carbon budget implementation reports. It'll be for all departments uh, to, to set out their policies, proposals and plans for meeting the carbon budget. And that implementation report will have to be agreed by the executive before it's laid in the assembly. So as Colin's correct in saying um, that DERA will have a coordination role in relation to that, but all departments will have to feed in, into that um, and clearly state uh, what they're going to do to meet that carbon budget for that five years. Okay, that's grand. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you both. Can I just ask, what, what, could you just elaborate on the watchdog? What happens if the departments are in default? So there is, uh, um, do, do, do you mean in terms of if, if we don't meet a carbon budget? Yeah. There, there, is, there will be a requirement for what we are terming as shortfall reports. And, and that's where, um, so if a carbon budget has not been met, then a report will have to be developed um, and will set out proposals and policies to compensate um, for the excess emissions in later budgeting periods. Um, that's quite a similar um, approach to else, elsewhere in the UK. I think Wales ha has applied a similar approach. Um, so there, there will be um, a mechanism there to, to, to tackle um, and, and to, to, for want of a better word, claw back um, any shortfalls. Um, and they, they can be carried over to other budgetary periods. So whenever a new carbon budget um, is developed, then that carbon budget will have to take on um, consideration um, of those recommendations or commitments within the shortfall reports. Um, it, it, it will depend on the timing. Uh, it's more likely due, due to five-year carbon budgets. It, it may be, as I say, it'll be open to where it can maybe not in the next consecutive carbon budget, potentially can be taken on board at the carbon budget after that or split between two carbon budgets, but there's definitely a mechanism to make up for any shortfalls. Okay, thank you. Morris? 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 Sorry about that, Chair. Oh, that you, Yes, that you. Oh, there. Thank you, Chair. Chair, a question for Colin. Uh, Colin, you mentioned carbon storing. Uh, what, what are the main proposals coming forward on carbon capture storage? What what plans uh, are in place to repair the damage to existing peatlands uh, and uh, wetlands by extraction and draining? And can you tell me what plans are in place to create more forest peatlands and wetlands throughout Northern Ireland? Uh, I think we're one of the least populated areas for trees in the whole of Europe. Uh, and if possible, what other me measures are being explored to create areas of carbon capture, which would also be a ben uh, of a benefit to wildlife? 
Yeah, so yeah. Um, I, I, I would, I, I'll not claim to be an expert in some of these things, and I'll probably have to refer you to uh, other colleagues for other briefings. So carbon capture and storage, the the main types that are being investigated at the minute are around carbon capture and storage at uh, energy plants, where that mm -hmm. carbon is captured and then stored, you know, underground or under the sea, etc. I don't, I don't have a massive understanding of that. I just know uh, the certainly what the projections are are carbon capture and storage was all or carbon storage was always more looked at natural means but now there's a lot more hope for technological means of capturing carbon and storing it mm -hmm. uh, i i probably can't give you a whole lot more on that in terms of repairing peatlands i know the the peatland strategy is due to be launched soon um, so you probably would want to get a briefing on that uh, i think i think you have requested an update on that. I think I saw your letter of last week maybe requesting that. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, forestry, there yes, we certainly have a very low forest cover at the minute. Uh, I was just over a year ago today, I was uh, in Cookstown helping plant those thousand trees. Um, when, when we had like 500 children, I can't imagine such a situation anymore. But, uh, you know, the Forest for Our Future program aims to do a lot more in that respect. Uh, peatlands, uh, yes, there are certainly issues with peatlands, but I, th I think peatlands are one of the big opportunities for Northern Ireland. We have a lot of peatland here. It can sequester a lot of carbon. So uh, never, I don't think we should see it as a challenge. I think we should see it as a real positive opportunity to create green jobs and restore our peatlands, sequester mm -hmm. carbon, and show all the good work that the agriculture and land use sector can do, uh, as the chair had mentioned earlier, in terms of sequestering carbon uh, and allowing us to still you know, have emissions from the excellent agri-food production. Uh, I think I've covered all your questions there. I'm sorry I'm not overly technical on some of them. You're all right, you've covered it well, Colin, and, and you just a minute to mention the benefit to wildlife from doing all that there, but that, that's, that'll come naturally. Uh, Colin, how, how do the proposals on the Climate Change Bill compare with the rest of the UK and indeed the EU. Whilst I would prefer Northern Ireland to have its own targets, uh, preferably more enhanced, but as you're aware, Northern Ireland remains within EU law uh, in terms of ETS, etc. But what impact will the Northern Ireland Protocol have on any proposed climate change bill uh, in Northern Ireland? Uh, my understanding is that it won't uh, have an impact. We still, you know, we're bound to meet the Paris Agreement. Uh, but that is on a UK basis, and our 82% or our at least 82% target does allow us as the UK to meet that uh, uh, Paris commitment. So m my understanding is it doesn't have any impact, but uh, if, if I'm wrong, Arlene or Anthony can shout at me very quickly. Okay, thanks, Colin. Uh, I, to either of you, uh, transport has been identified as a major contributor to greenhouse gas, and it's increasing. What possible plans have been discussed with other, other departments to move from road haulage to greater use of rail transport between major ports and towns? Uh, I feel that our rail infrastructure is not developed enough to promote goods between major destinations by rail. Has this been looked at as part of the bill? Uh, no, um, it hasn't. Uh, as, as, I suppose, as I said earlier, in, in an ideal world, it, developing a very large piece of primary legislation over maybe a four or five year period, you would have those sorts of provisions. But this bill is just very focused on setting the framework for climate change legislation and letting all departments, and I think in, the, in this case, it would be Department for Infrastructure in terms of real infrastructure uh, to, to develop their own policies. But you know, this, the Kickstarter for that really is legislation with strong targets so that you know there's real reputational damage to not starting to introduce policies to meet these targets. Well, that's good, thank you. One final one with your, with your indulgence, Chairman, and thanks for your patience. Uh, finally, I, I would ask, has any cost been attributed to what a Northern Ireland climate bill may cost? So, um, so we so far we have the general uh, details from the climate change committee, who have you know who have identified on a UK basis there's a significant economic benefit rather than cost. So they had said you know costs of around 0.5 percent of GDP per annum to give benefits of around 3 percent of UK GDP per annum. 
and up to 300,000 green jobs on a UK basis. So that's all very positive. We are working with the Climate Change Committee at the minute to investigate sort of Northern Ireland costs, particularly in terms of the enhanced reporting requirements and the enhanced you know, uh, work that the CCC would need to do for us. Uh, but I think the main thing to note is that really the costs or benefits to Northern Ireland depend on the exact policies that are chosen for this just transition. You know, there are there are many ways to skin a cat or whatever the expression is, but it's about us deciding exactly what you know what we do to meet that just transition. You know, there there are lots of different pathways which can leading us to get to at least 82 percent reductions uh, you know there are some big ticket items obviously like electrification is probably the main one in the ccc's recommendation uh, particularly you know electrification of transport electrification of heating um, but there are there are so many other options but i i see it only as a positive the you know the very fact of a just transition you know uh, in terms of electrification of heating if it's done properly you, you remove so many people out of fuel poverty uh, electrification of, of transport you uh, improve air quality significantly so the you know all, all i see is opportunities of if we do this right and, uh, and i would say i'm no expert in a lot of these but a lot of this but i enjoy reading about it and reading their evidence and evidence from lots of other people and engaging with lots of other jurisdictions but you know i suppose that, that that's my takeaway is it's benefit not cost yeah, I'd agree, Colin. The benefits outweigh any cost. So, thank you very much for your answers. That, thanks, me, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Rosemary. Rosemary. Thank you. Um, just to say, you'll be aware. Uh, over the last week, there was a headline in one of the agriculture paper, papers: "Climate Law to Cap Stock Numbers." You'll be aware of that headline, I'm sure, Colin. Oh yes. Colin, but reassurance can you give to those farmers who are outward and forward looking to think about passing on we t we talk about passing on our family farms to sons daughters etc cetera, etc cetera, and for them to progress further what uh, reassurance can you give to farmers in relation to that headline um, well, I suppose first I, I have got it and I have I have responded to it and I think I think the main thing says you know it's very hard to comment you know we don't have any agricultural policy at the moment to say what effects livestock numbers will have etc uh, there you know there have certainly been suggestions that moving some land use to other uses may be beneficial in terms of climate change but uh, i have to say i wouldn't really like to comment on any specifics such as livestock numbers because we simply don't know uh, and it's it's really about everybody playing their part uh, and it you know even it, i think the main thing is it wouldn't impact on the farmland itself uh, it may may involve some new working practices may involve like the for example if you look at the Climate Change Committee's sectoral plan for agriculture. They have a lot of very positive steps, you know, low carbon farming, etc. So it's about it's about having being part of that just transition. Um, I, d I don't think those headlines are helpful. Uh, I don't think we have really, you know, we have never gotten to that level of detail. So the, the, the Climate Change Committee did suggest that there would be a 20% reduction in eating of red meat as part of their, their transition and that's from behaviour change. So what they said at their, what this means for Northern Ireland presentation was that you know this would maybe mean that livestock numbers naturally reduce. But as I say, the common agricultural policy, the future agricultural policy will, will have more to say about that than I ever could. Uh, I just really what we're doing with the bill here is trying to set the framework to get things started and then let sectors discuss you know how they can reduce emissions. Yeah, I know that headline's caused quite a bit of unease within the farming agricultural community. And the second second question I want, I want to ask you is in relation to uh, if uh, if different groups are not, different departments are not meeting their, their targets, etc. You said there was mechanism, I think it was Arlene, you said there was a me mechanism to catch up within the following five years. Would it not be perhaps uh, more helpful that uh, departments were assessed maybe every two years to try and, try and write 
what they haven't been doing rather than yeah, so, the five years. So I suppose we uh, well there, there'd be a constant ongoing assessment in terms of the greenhouse gas inventory being produced every year. But when we're looking at reporting requirements, we had to sort of strike a balance because we've spoken to a number of other jurisdictions and you know one goes as much as yearly reporting. But then you spend your whole time re preparing reports uh, producing reports, uh, discussing reports, and not enough time actually in the action of it. So I suppose there's a balance to be struck. But every every year there will be a focus on how we're doing in terms of reductions. But the formal reporting will be on a slightly stretched, more stretched out basis to give time to really consider and work on things. Policy implementation takes time as well. But I think it's it's about getting that drive to get started, and that's really what we need. We need that kickstart. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll not take up any more time. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Okay, I, I, I'm just taking over the chair briefly. Uh, uh, William, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and can I thank you for your presentation, Colin and Arnie. Uh, in relation to the target of 82% by 2050, I think it's a big challenge. Uh, I think it's important that we set targets that are achievable. I'm a farmer all my life, so I am fully aware of uh, how important our agri-food sector is to the Northern Ireland economy and employs up to 100,000 people in Northern Ireland. Uh, we're told by the Climate Change Committee to reduce carbon to zero carbon to 2050, which would mean a substantial reduction in the output from the livestock farming sector in Northern Ireland. Uh, that, for me, uh, would be food hardly because we possibly would that, that food production would have to be replaced by some other country that in fact is contributing much more to global warming and much more to the carbon footprint than we are. Uh, would you accept that it would that this would be the case? I, I'm sure you did say early on to a question I think from Rosemary where we're, we're told that, that livestock production would have to be a substantial reduction. You have no idea what that substantial means at this stage, but substantial means a considerable amount. So uh, I think we need to be very careful. I would be, uh, I would support the 82% reduction. I think farmers will want to play their part, but I think we need to be sensible and as you've said earlier, do what is achievable. Uh, would, you, would you accept that to reduce production in Northern Ireland and import from countries that contribute more uh, wouldn't seem very sensible. Yeah, well, I suppose this is one of the reasons we're suggesting that at least 82% target because of the, you know, the ramifications of going for the net zero target. So, you know, while, as the CC say, say, there's no purely technical reason, you know, there are a lot of very good reasons, economic reasons, uh, you know, reasons of, uh, you know, we have a good food sector here. We have good food standards here. We have good animal welfare standards here. We are producing food for other regions of the UK. You know, it's a UK challenge and a global challenge. So, uh, you know, that, that is why we're suggesting this target. We, we don't want the major negative impacts on the economy. We want positive impacts in the environment, but we, people still need the pound in their pocket at the end of the day. Uh, so that, this is why the 82, at least 82% target has the right level of ambition with also respecting sort of the, the role Northern Ireland plays in agri-food production. And it's not just, at least 82% isn't just about agri-food production, I should say. Uh, the CCC highlighted as well, you know, even if you removed the agricultural element from the emissions reductions, Northern Ireland would still only be able to achieve a 93% reduction in emissions. because. A lot of that's to do with the fact that we're further behind and we have other unique challenges. You know, we have much fewer properties connected to the gas. Uh, we actually have quite a lot of older houses, you know, sort of rubble masonry type houses, which are harder to retrofit, um, good insulation on, and then, you know, use heat pumps, for example. So there, there are a lot of challenges. And I'll again say this this legislation will help us start to address some of these challenges in a way that's achievable, as you've said. You know, we want, William, something that is achievable that gets everybody to buy in. There's no point in having a target that, as I had said in my initial comments, that people just feel we're never going to do that. So why do we even bother? Absolutely. I agree. Oh, 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 OK, thank you. OK, William. Uh, Claire? 
Chair. Thanks, Chair. Um, and thanks, Colin and Arling. I completely agree. I think it is it's very exciting to, to hear the plans, um, but there's so much opportunity that um, does lie within this. But I want to follow on from uh, issues that Philip was raising there in terms of the number of respondents that are being counted um, with this, you know, and just put on record that this was a consultation that was put out during the Christmas holidays, during the lockdown Christmas holiday in particular, um, and came very quickly. Um, so I'm wondering what was the consideration before that? And I'm just taking into account we had the environment strategy last year from the department where we've seen over 2,000 respondents to that one. Um, so limiting this to, you know, four or 500 respondents is just to be noted about when the consultation was done. Uh, again, I want to come back to this 82%. I think it's, it's an absolute key one too. And I know that that is based on um, Northern Ireland's fair share, as it has been assessed within the UK bill. Um, and just linking that also to what you've raised, Colin, in particular with the, we're seeing in the, the Republic of Ireland that the emissions have increased. So if we're seeing increases um, in the Republic, and if we're looking at Northern Ireland going to 82 percent, um, you know that leaves us in a bit of a carbon black hole for the future. You know we are lagging behind, and the trajectory doesn't look great um, for 2050 because we know then that the executive has already set, um, signed up to introducing legislation and targets for re reducing carbon emissions in line with the Paris Climate Accord, and the spirit of that accord calls always for increased ambition to tackle climate breakdown to limit to two, two degrees warming but aiming for 1.5 so i'm wondering how you think that the current situation with increases in the republic us heading for 82 percent um fit with the spirit of that Okay, thank you, Claire. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I would I would share your opinion that this is very a very exciting time, you know, to get this bill finally through. Hopefully, um, in terms of the number of respondents, uh, I think uh, you know uh, whilst the, the number was small, I think it was fairly representative. You had all of the main uh, organisations responding. Uh, Obviously, we would have liked maybe a longer consultation period, but the main focus was on developing this bill. And the longer consultation would have meant even another four weeks in the consultation, we wouldn't be briefing you to early April. And that leaves a very short time frame. Uh, I think on balance, you know, the, the respondents were largely on balance in favour of uh, the evidence-based type target, but it, it was quite close. And... What we're trying to achieve here is, uh, is uh, as I've said several times, it's the sort of the, the level of ambition. We're not trying to limit ambition. At least 82% doesn't mean that we couldn't get to net zero by 2045 with huge ambition and major change in technology. But I would like to think if that was happening, we would uh, amend the bill accordingly at a later date. The bill is future proofed to allow those sorts of amendments. Uh, in terms of the uh, 82% being a fair share, I think the UK was the first major place to uh, suggest a net zero target by 2050. We, uh, taking politics aside, we you know we are part of the UK, um, so therefore our our share uh, of that would be 82%. Uh, it's like thinking, let's say uh, a large farming region in the GB. I don't you know I, I don't know one off. And they, uh, in on their own, probably aren't getting to net zero. But then there'll be another part of GB doing way more, like particular Scotland. If Scotland are doing much more, they have the land mass. I do understand. Uh, Listen, I'm just really what my concern is, you know, that I know that the department had asked from the Climate Change Commission Committee, sorry, for Northern Ireland's fair share, but did they also ask for a roadmap or, or advice on how we get to net zero or just to the, the fair share? Um, I, I believe we had previously asked them if you know net zero was possible. So I think you, I think the question to ask is what what is our and I think all the jurisdictions done, you know, what can we do? There's no point in saying we want to do this, how do we do it? If you know they've said it's uh, you know they've they've outlined how we could do it, but it's it's overly challenging and overly detrimental overall to Northern Ireland uh, for what I would always call 
a vanity project, you know, of us bringing carbon capture and storage here. Uh, it's a global challenge, and that, that's the main thing. You know, yes, I want to do as much as we can, and we all do, but we want an element of realism and buy-in, and okay. we will constantly update this, and we will constantly review this. It's not this is not a, a one and done. This is this is a good place to start. You know, let's get legislation in place. Yeah, well, then, I wholeheartedly agree with that, but it has to be the right legislation if it's going to be building the framework for the future um, as well. So in terms of those um, detrimental impacts to Northern Ireland, is that solely on the, the agri-food production? Where were the detriments to be seen? No, as as I said, so there is there is a there's a detriment in the agri food sector which uh, makes up between the 82 and the 93 percent. There's still a number of other areas. You know, it would be probably excessive cost to deal with some of the other issues. Um, there, you know, there's still a, there's still a, a, a remaining percent of, of emissions even after agriculture. Uh, offshoring food production just for the sake of getting 82 percent doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, and the CCC have said that. You know, that was not led by the department. Colin, you've been silent. You've been silent, Colin. Colin, we can't hear you. Colin. Sorry, did, did I lose you, sir? You lost it for a second or so. Oh, Can yeah, I sorry. I, I, I don't know. Get a bit of background interference as well. Go ahead, Colin. Yeah, oh, yeah sorry. I'm, hear, I'm hearing myself and nobody else there for a minute. Uh, so <laughs> so there's, there, there are a whole range of detrimental impacts, none of which we led the CCC to, to give us. We just simply asked them what we could do, and they gave us their advice. Uh, I... I fully recognise the role the agri-food sector plays in Northern Ireland. I fully recognise the fact that it, there are too many emissions from it at the minute, and we need to tackle those. And you know, the Ulster Farmers Union response to the consultation was quite clear in recognising that as well. But you know, I'd mentioned some of the other challenges earlier around the uh, you know the fact that we rely more on heating oil. The fact that you know a lot of our houses are more poorly insulated or harder to retrofit with insulation. The fact that we rely more heavily on transport because you know we're a lot more rural dwellers. There are so many factors at play, but th this is a good starting point for us to start to address all of them. And I would love to you know be appearing in front of you very soon again, and um, saying you know we've reviewed all this and we can go further once we start to implement. But I would you know I really do. I would really love to see the, your endorsement for this bill. It does have the main uh, aspects of effective climate change legislation. Okay, so is the 82% going to be a legal obligation within the bill? Uh, well, I suppose it's, it's, it's placed in legislation, which makes it uh, a legally binding target. Okay. On the, the interim and the five-year reporting, where do those reports go? Where, what? Oh, so they, yeah, they, yes, they have to. They're, they're led before the assembly, and I'll, I'll let Arlene speak about the exact specifics of that one. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so all, all all of the any um, progress reporting um, is coordinated by DERA with input from all other departments. Th that report then has to be agreed by the executive uh, and then is subsequently laid in, in the assembly. Um, and when we get a independent report, progress report from the CCC, uh, that, that will be publicly available uh, and then all departments will be required to develop a report in response to that progress report. That then also um, is required to be agreed to be laid then um, in the assembly. Okay, so is there any level of independent scrutiny or monitoring within the plans yeah. for the bill? Yes, that's that that that's what I was referring to before. The, the CCC uh, will be will have a role uh, within the bill to carry out um, an independent progress review um, of of. Um, carbon budgets, how we met our carbon budgets. So that'll be at the end of the carbon budget. And um, so they would put in their um, review um, advice and recommendations on that. Okay, and then so there's also an independent uh, review by the CCC um, of adaptation programs. 
um, and that will be done at a mid-term stage. Um, and some of that stage so to inform the next at, at, at a five-year adaptation programme. Okay, so the only level of independence then would be um, the interim reporting to the CCC? Yeah, well, I suppose, uh, well, I suppose, Claire, there's also, you know, you'll have the scrutiny of the committee on, on many of these things, and you'll also have the scrutiny of everybody in Northern Ireland who and everybody in the UK who doesn't, if they don't feel we're doing enough. So there'll be no shortage of scrutiny by people, I think. Yeah, I'll do a couple one last one if possible, please, uh, uh, Chair, because um, we seem to be very wedded to this um, idea that if we cut our agri emissions here, that they simply with the food production that they'll simply be um, produced elsewhere. Because um, so I want to ask you, what studies have been done into the risk of that type of carbon leakage to support that stance? Um, and that any you know strict climate legislation here will be the result in, in emissions being outsourced to other countries because I'm looking at with dairy for example um, there's very few countries who could actually fill that gap in the market and we'll look at New Zealand for example being one of the mainland or main ones but New Zealand already have their own climate legislation so the risk of carbon leakage there would be really quite small to not happening, you know, um, and other countries all signed up to the Paris Accord, uh, uh, other countries with their own legislation as well have to meet that. So where are we getting that information from? Where's the studies to show that one? Hang on, hang on, Colin, can all of the members who aren't speaking please mute your microphones because we are getting interference here, which is affecting the audio. Okay, uh, Colin and Arlene, do you want to pick up on Claire's um, Questions? Yeah, so I suppose uh, I suppose the main thing is I, I don't have a report to hand, but you know the, the the simple fact is that people still need to eat, and there's still a demand for meat and dairy, and where where that demand is in place, you know economics would say there will still be a supply. Uh, you know there's there's significant beef supply, for example, from Brazil where they're cutting down rainforests to continue to supply that. Uh, that's something you know. I certainly don't want to promote. Uh, we have we have been shown to have very good levels of carbon footprint in terms of our agri production. We of course could be better, um, and I think that even th those targets will mean some impacts for agriculture. It's inevitable there will be some imp impacts for every sector, but in terms of an, an actual study to say that, uh, other than what the CCC have advised us, I, I don't have one to hand. Okay, thanks. And then just lastly, sorry, Chair, <laughs> that is up on the last one. That was the last one. So, I mean, we're looking very heavy on the, the carbon, carbon targets, carbon emissions and reductions within the bill. So what are we looking at here? What's going to be included in terms of biodiversity targets, nitrogen targets, just transition mechanisms? We know that ammonia is not a, a greenhouse gas nor a carbon, but yet, you know, year after year after year, we're, you know, not doing very well on that. So what's the plans within the bill to meet those types of targets? Uh, there, there isn't. This is a very foc this is climate change legislation focusing on climate change and the aspects in order to set a legally binding framework for climate change. You know there are lots of plans in place for other legislation to address those. But as I said in my introduction, <clears throat> if we started to add in all of those, then really where do you stop in this primary legislation? Uh, every department would then be asking for all sorts of other hook-on provisions. Uh, if a bill isn't focused. It, you're talking a four or five year bill development period to get in everything that every department would want in a piece of primary legislation. Okay, thank you very much. Cheers, Colin. Thank you, Claire. Okay, then, uh, Colin and Arlene, um, I think that, that, that was a very um, wide ranging um, series of questions and answers. Um, there's no more members going to ask questions, um, but I, I just want to. Before I finish off here, I just want to just pull back, go back to one thing that did mention, and that was the cross-border aspect of it, uh, Colin and Arlene. Um, I think I know what you said there, Colin. This was a a global, it's a global issue, but I do think it's important to remind that in areas like County Clone and Tremana, there where Rosemary is from, there are farm where the border runs dead through fields. You know, so. You know, it, it wouldn't make absolute sense, and certainly if you're setting any transition targets or anything out there, that, that there need to be a harmonisation there. Um, you know, and also clearly what we're seeing from hearing from what you're saying there as well, 
the land use and the agriculture production across the island of Ireland uh, has more similarities than across the water in Britain because clearly across the water in Britain we can see that that the, British, the, the UK government they're effectively driving down agriculture production and they're they're turning uh, they're, they're they're taking very much of the public payment for public goods so they're, they seem to be driving down food production uh, which will make their their, their GHG emission targets look good, whereas at the same time Ireland is effectively feeding Britain uh, because we overproduce whilst they underproduce. So is there any global, uh, and, and of course again over in Britain too you obviously you have a larger uh, area per population than the likes of Scotland and the access to the North Sea as well for, for carbon storage. So is there any global sort of calculator whereby uh, we, we can look at that in the round you know, where, where, where we aren't uh, where effectively we aren't over, or where, where effectively where, 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 where it is taken into account when you're looking at the emissions in Britain, that you're taking into account that they are driving down their free production and reducing their uh, emissions, whilst at the same time importing uh, from here and indeed from other parts of the world. Yeah, well, I suppose the thing to say is that you know emissions are are calculated on a production basis, you know, in the country of production. So, in in essence, what what has been done is that there's been a recognition of what Northern Ireland does in terms of agri-food and the production emissions reduction targets have been set on that basis. So, like, it, you know, the UK or GB as a whole recognise that role of Northern Ireland as uh, producing more and therefore let's say Scotland, who have more land, will do more in terms of getting to UK net zero than we can because they are getting the benefit of us producing more food for them. So I think it has been fully appreciated and taken into account. You know, nobody is uh, nobody's pointing the finger at us and saying, oh, you're not doing enough. What they're saying is, oh, you know, you're doing lots of other things for us. Therefore, we can take a bigger share of reductions as long as you keep doing those things for us. And what about the the, the cross border dimension? You no, know, obviously across the island, but very acutely on on farms which, which actually straddle the border, where there's an invisible line through their fields. Yeah. So I suppose uh, in terms of cross border cooperation, obviously we'll you know we will have extensive cross border cooperation through like British Irish Council, for example, on adaptation, yeah. uh, which you know and that that island challenge is very very real on adaptation because you know the agriculture and land use sector are probably one of the ones who are going to be impacted most by climate change and needing to adapt to it. But uh, I think uh, it'll probably be up to sector specific plans to gauge just how much and how wide that engagement and cooperation is. Uh, but I would imagine uh, for the likes of agriculture, it will be very wide. Okay, that's great. Well, thanks very much, uh, Colin and Arlene and Anthony. Uh, that was very helpful and um, very detailed responses as always. I want to thank you for your attendance. Yes, we're still in the morning hey, this morning, and uh, I wish you all the best and no doubt we'll be be in contact with you in the, the days and weeks ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We're always happy to come and chat to you. Um, thank you very much, and you're always welcome. Take care. Thank now. you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. No problem. Bye bye. Okay, members. Members, we're moving on to item six on the agenda, which is the um, the oral evidence session, waste, crime, and update on the boy. And before we start the session, can I state that the committee has agreed not to hear from Dara? On the, on the matter of Muboy. This is because that the alleged operators of the Muboy Road site are currently being prosecuted for offences under the Waste and Contaminated Land NI Order 1997. Therefore, those criminal proceedings are active within the meaning of the Contempt of Order Act 1981. This means that Standing Order 73 on Subjudice is active. Okay, members, I'm going to move on now to item 7. Uh, department, departmental written briefing. Uh, uh, Jack, you're, you're, t you're still taking the oral evidence session on waste crime, just not the aspect on the boy. Oh, sorry. My apologies. My apologies. Uh, sorry about that now. Uh, okay. We, okay, then I want to just specify, yes, the oral evidence session on waste crime, but not on the boy. So um, I want to welcome then... Um, uh, okay, so the memo from the tracks is page 408, uh, paper from the Department of Waste Crime at four page 413. Um, okay. Uh, 
Okay. So uh, can we just go straight to the start date then, Stella? Yeah. Yes. Um, Message, yes. Yeah, I want to welcome by Starleaf uh, Tim Irwin, Director of Resource Efficiency Division, Theresa Kearney, Senior Principal Scientific Officer, Jonathan Gray, Project Manager, and Mark uh, Cherry, Principal Scientific Officer. Okay. Okay, can you hear us, sir? It has to be added into Spotlight. Okay. Can you just confirm with us, Stella, whenever? The witnesses are now there. Okay. Good. Um, Tim, please, uh, good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome you here this morning. Um, and I don't know where you heard me saying previously that uh, the committee has agreed not to hear from Dara on the matter of the boy. Uh, the alleged operators of the Maboy roadside are currently being prosecuted for offences on the way of the Hamlet land. Then I order next seven. Therefore, those criminal proceedings are active within the meaning of the contempt of court. That means it's standing order 70 and subject to say So um, we will take evidence in relation to the way of crime, but not on the boy if that is uh, okay. I want to remind members to stick to one question because we are under uh, quite um, challenging time constraints. At the moment. So, uh, I'm going to be uh, officials to uh, address the committee. Good, good morning, Chair and Committee members. Uh, I'm Tim Irwin, Director of Resource Efficiency Division within the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. And as you said, I'm joined this morning by my colleagues, Mark Cherry, who's Head of Enforcement Branch, and Theresa Kearney, Head of Regulation Unit. And we're here today to give you a bit of a, an update on the waste crime. And as you're well aware, there are many facets to waste crime. It covers everything from small-scale flight to instance. Sorry, sorry, sorry for cutting you off, Tim. Could all members and anybody else who's not speaking, please turn off your your microphones because Tim is getting uh, is affecting the audience, uh, affecting the audio. Okay, Tim, sorry for cutting you off. Do you want to just turn away? Not at all. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I was just saying that... Turn their microphones off if they're not speaking. The Sorry, Stella. If the witnesses could also turn their microphones off if they're not speaking. Yeah. Could witnesses do that as well, please? Okay. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Right. Uh, okay. As I was saying, there are many facets, facets to, to waste crime, which covers everything from, from small-scale fly tipping incidents to the large-scale illegal dumping of waste. And we all have a part to play in helping to eradicate it. And if you're content, Chair, Mark will provide just a very short five-minute update on waste crime, and then we're happy to take questions from the committee. Okay. Hello, Chair. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Mark, perfectly. Uh, good morning, Chair, and good morning, committee members. Uh, thanks for taking this time to, to listen to me this morning. I just, as Phil, uh, Tim said there, I'll give you a short introduction on the issue, and then happy to take questions after that. But just by way of background, uh, in terms of waste crime, uh, it takes many forms, as Tim has said there, including fly tipping, illegal dumping, or burning of waste, deliberate misdescription of waste, operation of illegal waste management sites, and large-scale waste disposal. The motivation uh, of those involved is largely driven by financial gain or financial saving, mainly concerning larger scale organised criminality, with other factors such as laziness, proximity to local amenities, and the simple disregards for the environment playing a part, and that would mainly concern small scale offending such as fly tipping. Illegal waste offending can cause serious risk to the environment and human health. Uh, the financial burden of remediation and cleanup frequently being borne by the public purse, diverting funding from other priority areas. In NI, the primary piece of legislation which regulates the management of waste is the Waste and Contaminated Land Order in 1987. And under the order, the department has the authority to investigate and prosecute those who dispose of waste illegally, and that's without a permit or authorization. There are also powers available to the uh, district councils in respect of remediation and cleanup. Uh, the levels of reported crime within NI, incidents of environmental crime, including illegal waste disposal, are reported to the department. 
through a number of channels, including the members of the public, local councils, other law enforcement agencies, and their staff themselves. All incidents are recorded on the incident reporting and information system uh, within the departments called ARIS. And the level of reporting for the calendar years 2018 to 2020 has been provided to the committee members in, in, in the advance brief. Reports may also be received and action by district council. These generally get to smaller scale flight tipping, and that data is not at present uh, routinely reported to the department. In terms of the AG's resourcing uh, to tackle the issue, uh, uh, it's a down to my branch, Northern Environment Disease and Environmental Crime Branch. The branch should have a full complement of 40, but at the minute we're currently running on an average of 22 or 32 staff over the past 18 to 24 months. The branch uh, is broken into uh, three or four sections. Uh, the Environmental Crime section uh, is the first section, which has the responsibility for the conduct of investigations relating to large scale offending, which pose greater risk to the environment and often involve serious organised criminality. Such investigations generally result in criminal prosecutions within the Magistrates Court and the Crown Court and are often accompanied with financial investigations under the Proceeds of Crime Act. The volume crime section within the branch have responsibility for the conduct of investigations at the lower level uh, enforcement uh, offending such as fly tipping. And such investigations generally result in low level enforcement outcomes such as warnings, fixed penalty notices, criminal prosecutions within the Magistrates Court. We also have a financial investigation section which has responsibility for conduct of financial investigations under the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, including confiscation investigations, money laundering investigations, and cash seizure or forfeiture uh, against those convicted of waste offences. And finally, there's a small assessment section within the branch, which coordinates all information and intelligence exchange with enforcement partners, further providing detailed analysis and threat assessments, which are used to determine crime priorities. They provide research and development in support of our criminal investigations and administer the agency's waste crime incident management system. Criminal investigation staff in both the environmental crime section and the volume crime section have been trained in the investigative practices by uh, approved credited courses and also by the provision of relevant investigative training provided by the PSNI. The financial investigators are accredited through the National Crime Agency and have to attain specific accreditation and participate in continuous development activities and continuous compliance stringently monitored by the National Crime Agency. The assessment in section includes a dedicated analyst to develop analytical and problem solving techniques and reports regarding information and intelligence on waste crime. These reports assist the branch and its staff in developing investigative type methodologies and approaches to tackling the issue. Uh, the post became vacant in December of last year and we're still awaiting to recruit a, a new member of staff. All of the incidents to the agency are recorded on the bespoke incident management system. Uh, there are varying levels of enforcement approach uh, and the range of outcomes which are dependent on such factors as the scale of offending, the environmental impact, the knowledge and intent of the offender, and a consistent approach is taken across all in line with our enforcement policy. Such outcomes include advice and guidance, warning letters, fixed penalty notices, statutory notices, criminal prosecutions, and where appropriate, they will be coupled with confiscation proceedings under the Proceeds of Crime Act. A summary of enforcement outcomes for the last five years has been provided as part of the advance brief. The issue cannot be tackled alone by the department uh, and there's good benefit in working in partnership with other bodies and keys on either a specific issue of waste crime or organised criminality in the broader sense. Some of our key partners include the following, the uh, Police Service of Northern Ireland. The NIA has a long-running partnership with PSNI who provide invaluable operational support in the serving of warrants, arrest and detention of suspects, assistance with search and seize operations and the provision of bespoke training to NIA staff and there are a number of relevant information sharing agreements in place with that organisation. Uh, HMRC, the NIA has in place an MOU and a number of ISAs with HMRC to allow sharing of information and collaborative working in respect of waste crime and the avoidance of the relevant environmental taxes, which include landfill tax, aggregates levy and associated VAT charges. The NIA also work closely with the HMRC in, in sharing information in relation to waste generated from fuel laundering. The NIA is a member of the Organised Crime Task Force Strategy Group and it's appointed subgroups. The OCTF brings together law enforcement agencies within the NI, such as PSNI, NCA, HMRC, Border Force and the Department of Justice in providing a coordinated approach to serious and organised criminality in the NI. Uh, over the last few years, the branch has worked to raise the profile of environmental crime amongst our law enforcement partners. In 2019, and um, following an independent review into organised crime in, in the waste sector in England and Wales, the then Home Secretary, Theresa Villiers, announced the formation of the English Environment Disease Joint Unit for Waste Crime. 
This unit brought together various law enforcement agencies, such as the English Environment Agency, Natural Resources Wales, NCA, the Police, Border Force and HMRC, to provide a more coordinated and joined up approach to waste crime in England and Wales. In 2020, the NIA signed an MOU on supporting ISA with the uh, EA and are now a member of the Joint Unit for Waste Crimes Oversight Board and its Tactical Tasking Group. Whilst the unit was formed to tackle waste crime in England and Wales, it is recognised that such criminality can have footprints across all four UK jurisdictions. We all face similar issues and challenges, and the step to bring the jurisdictions under one umbrella was a logical step. Uh, finally, local councils, uh, both the NIA and local councils have powers to deal with illegal waste disposal through the Local and Central Government Waste Working Group and the Northern Ireland Strategic Waste Partnership. The NIA has been working with councils on the development of a revised fly tipping protocol. The protocol provides clarity on the rules and responsibilities of both the councils and the NIA in addressing fly tipping and illegal waste disposal. The protocol runs in tandem with plans to bring forward commencement of the remaining sections of the Waste and Contaminated Land Amendment Act 2011, which will provide not just powers to both the councils and the department, hence the need for the protocol. In short, under the protocol, a local council will deal with all illegal, illegal waste disposal under 20 metres cube, including hazardous waste uh, of a volume and type that would be accepted at a council recycling centre, and the NIA will deal with all illegal waste deposits over 20 metres cube including hazardous waste such as asbestos on fuel laundering waste. The protocol also provides a commitment uh, by the NIA and the councils to, to improve our data recording and reporting on the issue of waste crime, including fly tipping. The NIA also has working relationships and information sharing agreements in place with a number of other partners, such as the uh, DVA, London Property Service, the Forensic Service of NI and Department for Communities. Uh, I have provided uh, a number of tables with the advanced brief, which give information on the range of outcomes in relation to enforcement action taken by the agency for the period 2016 to 2020. Uh, I will make a comment just on two of those tables, Chair. Table two uh, shows no court outcomes for the period 2020. This was due to the fact that no waste cases were concluded in the courts during that year as a consequence of the serious, uh, severe disruption of the court schedules due to the COVID pandemic. On table three, as well as far exceeding financial penalties in terms of fines, confiscation orders carry a clear crime prevention message. The process deprives offenders of the proceeds of their criminal conduct, removes the means for offenders to further offend and sends a clear message to, offend, to those contemplating leg activity. The crime does not pay. In addition to the crime prevention message, DERA uh, are party to the Asset Recovery Incentivization Scheme, a scheme administered by the Department of Justice. Under the scheme, DERA recovered 22.5% of all paid confiscation orders and can be used to drive up asset recovery or otherwise to fight crime in line with Section 96 of the Justice Act, Northern Ireland 2011. Whilst the Department is not reliant on incentivization monies to maintain its enforcement function, the income has been of significant benefit. In previous years, expenditure has included investment in crime training, crime stoppers campaigns, valuations of land and property, purchase of equipment and license of software to aid financial investigation and intelligence functions, all of which has had a positive effect on the ability of the enforcement branch to tackle crime. Sure, that's my very short oral brief, and I'm happy to take questions. But before doing so, I'm sure the committee is aware that I cannot discuss specifics on current enforcement matters because this is an open session, although happy to consider further requests for information outside of this meeting. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mark. I'm going to move very swiftly around the members because we are we are fast run out of uh, broadcasting time here due to the ad hoc meeting being scheduled um, shortly. Uh, John? Chair, thank you, and kind of thank the, the team for for their information provided today. Um, I want I want to refer to the tables, the fines and the penalties, and the income from those. And I note that that twenty twenty was impacted by the COVID restrictions and the lack of progress of some cases in in court. Um, the figures show that fines total one hundred and forty four thousand, um, confiscations eight hundred and sixty eight thousand. Um, although we just have been told that the, the department probably only received about £200,000 of that, and fixed penalty notices totalling somewhere around 57000 These figures are for a five-year period. I assume, therefore, that they don't go very far towards actions preventative or, or remedial taken by the department. And in light of that, can I ask, this is the second part of the question, 
I received information from the minister recently in, in, a, in a written question uh, that there's currently a consultation taking place with departments or with councils in, about increasing the levels of fines, increasing the numbers of actions. Can we get any more information on that today? Yes, John, I, I can, can answer that. Uh, I mentioned the fly tipping protocol in my, my oral brief there and a reference to bringing forward the remaining sections of the Waste uh, Amendment Act 2011. Uh, at the minute, John, the Environment Agency, that's ourselves, have powers to enforce under Article 4 of the Waste and Contaminated Land Order uh, and, and Article 5 of that order as well. But the Article 4 allows us to issue fixed penalty notices up to a value of £400 for illegal waste disposal. Uh, at the minute, the councils are tied with the basically the letter order, which only allows them to issue fixed penalties up to eighty pounds uh, at a court, a two and a half thousand pound penalty. The plan is to bring forward that, that commencement, uh, which will give the district councils the same, same powers under 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 the orders of what we have. So councils will then have the ability to issue uh, increased fixed penalties up to four hundred pounds, but also uh, take prosecutions to the magistrates court, which attract the bigger. A penalty of uh, a financial pay, uh, a fine up to fifty thousand pound or a two year imprisonment sentence at, at, at summary conviction. Mark, thank you. That's helpful. Is there any? And I understand this was still under consideration, but is there any proposed timeline for the uh, outcome for councils? Yeah, John, we've been working with the councils for, for God for about twenty four months on this here. Now we've got the protocol agreed uh, as regards bringing forward the legislation. Um, some councils ha have reservations that bringing forward that legislation would put an, an extra burden in terms of enforcement responsibility upon them. Uh, um, they had questioned whether there should be a, a, a regular daily impact assessment done on that legislation. Well. John, to be honest, that legislation was passed back in 2011, almost nine years ago. And at that point, uh, an RAA uh, assessment was made by the department. Or, and at that point, they didn't feel that the department didn't feel that a full RAA was required because it didn't place additional burden on the councils. Now, uh, councils have come back on that in the past year or so, uh, and we've sought uh, further advice from our own uh, departmental solicitor's office and also reconsidered the matter in-house. And we are still of a position that a full regularly impact assessment does not need to be carried out, and we should just move forward with the commencement. But in saying that, we're working in partnership with, with, with the councils, John. Uh, at the minute, the, the way it sits is the councils are pulling together a workshop between the 11 councils just to tease out what this would mean in terms of their enforcement capability whenever this uh, legislation is commenced. They're then going to come back to the department with any outworkings from that, which we'll further consider before we decide to bring forward that legislation. So at the minute, John, we're just waiting on some more feedback from the, the councils before we would advise the minister and whether to commence that legislation. Okay, well, we can we can follow that with Andrew Mark. Thank you. That's sure, I can't hear you. Declan, you're on mute. My fault, Rosemary. Sorry about that, <laughs> Rosemary. Thank you, thank you, Kenneth. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation, Mark. Um, Certainly, Rosie. Just to say, Mark, um, you're, what you're saying sounds good, looks good, but I have come across a number of cases in Fermanagh where occasionally you will have the odd sheep, the odd calf dumped on lands that don't belong to anybody. And I have, I have, I have actually went to NIEA, went to the local council, and both have said it's not their responsibility; it's the landowner. The problem is the landowner didn't dump it, and very often it's very difficult to find out who the landowner is. Any response to that? Well, Rosemary, uh, I deal with the waste issues. Uh, the animal issue, we would normally refer to our veterinary service and animal health group uh, within the department, and they would usually arrange or engage with the councils or the landowner to clean up or remove that, that, that carcass. So, Rosemary, I couldn't give you a definitive answer on that at the minute, but I'm quite happy to, to, to uh, follow up and, and provide some further information on it. Okay, I'll, I'll follow up with you on that. Uh -huh. Just one other question. What, what budget do, they, do NIA have allocated to them at the moment? Or waste crime. When you say a budget, is that the uh, overhead budget, the wages, yeah. all that? I th it's around, uh, in and around one point seven million, I think, at the moment. Right. That covers covers all costs. That's that's wages uh, and our operational costs as well. Right. 
and you, you, fi you find that adequate? Or it's well, Rosemary, at the minute, it's adequate, uh, uh, but it's uh, obviously bolstered a wee bit by the, the, the income from the proceeds of crime, which, as I said earlier, it provides a great, great benefit uh, to us. Okay. Right. That's okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, then. Uh, Patsy? Patsy? Thank you, Chair. I'm online here. Um, now, it may well be the case that we'll require full... full uh, written response to this, but the Mills report, and there, there was um, an internal audit report into implementation in 2015. Um, can you uh, give me, or has there been a detailed action plan produced on foot of the Mills report, or is there one in existence, and how has that been developed by the department? But Patsy, yep, the Mills report was back in uh, uh, 2013, um, and my understanding is that there was, yes, there was a full action plan put in place on the back of the Mills report, which has been reported on on a number of occasions over the past six or seven years, and I understand that most, if not all, of those recommendations have been implemented, but uh, Patsy, there, there are correspondences on that, and uh, it's not my whole particular area because the Mills report covered a broad range of recommendations across the whole, yeah. whole department here. So you can certainly have the full written response on that, but I just can't get Chair, the graphics at the moment. Chair, if, if, I, if yeah. I could come in on that, just, just to reassure Patsy, all the recommendations which were for DERA have been uh, undertaken, completed, progressed. So th that included things like the, the strengthening of the legislation around fit and proper person, duty of care, registration of carriers, uh, and then improving the regulatory role and, and risk-based inspections and, and targeting inspections. So all of that work through the Mills report that we were responsible for taking forward has been done. There was one issue which has been uh, has gone back to the, the committee uh, in terms of questions, which was around uh, DFI and the planning side of things, and uh, that hasn't been taken forward by DFI because of a, a legislative issue. Right. I think it would be helpful if we got a written uh, reply on that, just about the various actions undertaken by the department. If there's one in existence, that's grand. Uh, and if now are these are these actions now? Just I was listening carefully to to your words there, Tim. Have these actions taken place to allow further actions to take place, if you know what I mean? How various aspects of the framework, in other words, those relevant parts that apply to the department, are they in action now? Yes, Patsy, all the recommendations are in action. They've been done and they're in action. Right. So, okay. So I think, Chair, if we could get a written briefing on that, it would be very helpful. Yeah. Okay, Patrick, happy enough for that? Okay. Just, just one thing about that. Um, anything further, any sort of um, things that the department could have seen that could be developed a bit further or indeed even enhanced on the basis of the Mills report since that? Because we know times can change, circumstances can change. If there's anything further that the department has added to that or enhanced or developed it even further, that, that would be very, very helpful as well if we could get an update. All yeah, right. Patrick. Happy to do that. Okay, Patrick. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Claire? Thank you, Chair. Apologies, I dropped out there and I'm back in again, but without my camera. So apologies for that. I don't know why, but here I am. <laughs> just, um, I just want to ask, um, whose responsibility is it to make sure that um, operators are aware of their legal obligations? Does that role fall with the Environment Agency or is that Labour councils. Clara, I presume when you say operators, you mean waste operators, those who would operate yes. a waste, waste management facility. I, again, our regulation teams are on the line here, but it would be for the the agency, obviously within the with the permits that are that are sent out and agreed with those operators. That there's a full uh, list of, of uh, conditions that the operator would need to apply with, and they would be fully aware of their their, their commitment onto those 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 conditions. Okay, so that's uh, environment agency responsibility. Yeah. And what about waste producers? Is that the same? I would have to ask Theresa Kearney if she's on the line there uh, to, to answer that, because that's part of the regulation team, Claire. Okay. Theresa, yeah, do you want to come yes. in on that? 
Uh, yes, thanks, Tim. Um, absolutely, clear that would be the responsibility of the producers, uh, and the, they have particular pieces of documentation under the producer responsibility regulations to complete, to demonstrate their duty of care and the, the chain of utility of, of the waste as it moves from their premises. Okay, and do you know if any operator licenses then have been revoked by the department for waste crimes? particularly during the period of the last mandate? Uh, well, that certainly was the case, Claire, for the operators at the Moboy, at the city, uh, city industrial waste site. Um, their licence was revoked back in 2013. Um, so that's certainly one. No bother. I don't want to go anywhere near that um, particular example just yet. But my last quick question, has there ever been um, a real coordinated north-south approach to tackling waste crime? Claire, on that, there, when you say a real coordinated approach, there's certainly connections between ourselves uh, up north here and down south through uh, the EA uh, down there. And there have been Five Nations uh, waste crime meetings over the past number of years uh, held in different jurisdictions over that period where they're all, all, all five countries come together and discuss the issue of waste crime. So we do have our channels within the EA down there, but, but also the Dublin City Council, who are responsible for the transfrontier shipment of waste regulations which sit within our regulation team uh, so there was any illegal activity in terms of transport of waste across the border there's certainly a connection there with, with Dublin City Council who the the, the authority on, on that piece of legislation thank you okay thank you chair um Harry okay thank you very much chair uh, appreciate it. with Dublin of tires I'm just wondering why are dealers not held more responsible as like I mean we know for every tire sold or placed there's a worn out carcass there so numbers are easy accountable for. Um I'm just wondering are charges exist uh, uh, there are charges that do exist and they are paid. I wonder what do you know how much they are at present? And are you monitoring this situation and is it being enforced? Harry, first of all, yep. Yeah, when you take your your tire to a, a garage and have it changed, uh, a number of the garages or retailers would put, put an environmental charge on your bill. It's one or two pound, I think, at the minute. That's actually a voluntary charge, and it's not a, a legal requirement to have it put on, on place. And you don't have to pay that okay. uh, environmental charge. You're quite take your, your tire away. But yes, you're right. Uh, the issue of tires is, is a problem, and we see them dumped quite regularly around the countryside. A problem we have at the minute is we don't see both sides of the equation. And what I mean by that is we can certainly see that the number of tires dumped or, or, or changed by an operator, but we don't see how many they're purchasing because that's on a commercial side of the house. So, so we don't see both sides of the balance, so to speak. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're a bit of a, a loss there, but we have focused in on tire retailers uh, quite heavily over the past couple of years. Uh, and I know in 2019, uh, the department here carried out over 168 inspections of tire retailers mm -hmm. to check their paperwork in terms of how, how many tires they were, which tires they were producing and where they were going to. And we've done follow-up work with those who weren't compliant uh, and that and try to tighten, tighten down on that. And anecdotally, yes, we, we got feedback from some of the, the major tire reprocessors that they had, they had increased uh, business or inquiries from, from, from tire retailers for proper reprocessing. So that was a good piece of work. Um, unfortunately, uh, Harry, because of the pandemic last year, that really hit our program of work and we only got 37 done last year. We had to basically stop off our march last year, but hopefully when the, the restrictions are released, we'll be able to carry on through with that program of inspections. Yeah, and would you say that facilities are adequate for the disposal? I mean... Well, the, 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 the two or three major tire reprocessors here are regulated by our own uh, regulation teams and, and they're ad adequate facilities. I think the issue is, is, is about the, the, the small scale uh, garages uh, and local tire retailers uh, ensuring that they properly pass their, their waste tires on to those to those authorised reprocessors rather than have them dumped, as you say, Harry, uh, on some country lane somewhere. Yeah, as you say, the numbers, if you could see the numbers sold, then you would know that's the numbers that need to be accounted for. Yeah. So and, and Harry, yes, that, that's a bit of a, a, a weak spot where we don't see that side of the, the equation because we don't have the authority to go in and ask for accounts and, and invoices and things like that. Yep, so a bit of work to do there. Yep, appreciate yep. it. Thank you very much, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, okay. We're moving on here. William? Can all members, or everybody who's not speaking, turn their... Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, an observation for me and a very quick question. But I mean, 
in relation to fly tipping and dump on legally in a small way, local councils seem to be able to deal with that fairly well. I understood, you know, there was such fines. But for me, um, the large uh, criminal gangs that deal in this, is there a need for further legislation to deal with this, or is there, legis is there enough in place to deal with this in relation to legislation? Sometimes I think those that are doing this and making mega money out of it seem to get away while the, the, the person that dumps a, a potato crisp bag, they're fine. Uh, and rightly so, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that, but I think it's important that there's legislation in place or there's enough in place to deal with the large, the large criminal gangs that's doing this. Well, William, um, in terms of legislation, I've, uh, at the minute, I believe we have the sufficient powers to sort of tackle the issue. And as I said earlier on there, we have the issues of the Proceeds of Crime Act in terms of dealing out significant penalties as a deterrent. I think the real work needs to be done in and around uh, the various law enforcement agencies joining up to tackle organised crime gangs because uh, typically one type of criminal involved in one type of activity will usually be involved in a number of criminal activities. So ourselves through through our, our work in the OCTF and developing our intelligence and information sharing network there, that will assist on and, 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 and targeting these the organised criminal gangs. In relation to seizing assets of criminal gangs, is there enough powers to do that? Because, uh, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm without, without yeah. yeah, well, we know we do. We do use the Proceeds of Crime Act uh, to seize and restrain assets uh, of, of all our significant criminal cases. And I think that's quite, quite, quite adequate at, at the minute. Uh, there's some changes coming to that, that, that legislation uh, later on this year, which will give us some small additional powers in terms of cash seizure. But generally speaking, William, that, that, that's a, quite a strong and robust piece of legislation, quite a forceful piece of legislation. Uh, well, that's very important. OK, thank you. Okay, and just before we, we finish off this section here, um, I just want to um, maybe mention to you, um, Mark or, or Tim, um, one of the one of the biggest bugbears for local communities is the, the tipping, the, the rubbish that you see discarded along the local roads. And I think in particular during the, the last lockdown there, we've seen um, uh, extra really good examples of local communities and families and sport, sporting and cultural organisations reclaiming their local roads and taking part in the range and litter picks and, and initiatives such as that there to, to reclaim their roads and, and tidy up their communities. Would, would the department be minded to look at a, a scheme whereby you could assist those organisations and local voluntary groups to um, enable them and support them and, and carrying out those types of activities, particularly in the smaller localised side roads, you know, where, where maybe council officials don't, don't you know, can't reach, given the resource implications of that. Declan, maybe I could just kick that off with, with a wee bit. We do provide uh, quite a bit of funding. Uh, the department provides quite a bit of funding for Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful for a lot of these. Uh, keep uh, your, your countryside tidy type schemes, which involve local community groups. Uh, and we've also been engaging recently, um, working with the GAA on their Green Clubs initiative and trying to see how we can empower uh, sport to get involved in some of these cleanup as well, because you've got that blend of youth and enthusiasm uh, mm. and and then just tying into that as well. And it's a mix of, of, um, of just getting that behavioural change and, and getting uh, people to understand about how to properly deal with, with um, their, their litter. So there, there's messaging, there's, there's an education process needed alongside the regulatory and enforcement stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, those campaigns that we do, we, we put out uh, tweets and stuff about disposing of litter properly. As I say, we work with the Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful. And we try to get that behavioural change running as well. And we do a lot of work with the, the NGOs to transport that mm -hmm. right across all of Northern Ireland. Yeah, well, uh, I suppose um, now that you mentioned that, I should, I should declare an interest because it's something that I've been involved in having myself over the, certainly over the course of the last year and beyond. But I do believe that the, the pandemic and the lockdown has created an added sense of people getting out there and getting ownership of local roads and pride in their community. And I think that's something that the department and uh, and the various NGOs and organisations should, should really, really 
uh, capitalize and build on. I also should say that uh, one of the, the biggest gripes as well is see people who discard litter from the car windows, particularly when they drive off the main roads where they're more likely to be caught. When they're just when they go into the side roads, they fire the litter out to the window. And I do believe that uh, if the department really put a big focus on a blend of assisting local communities and vulnerable organisations to reclaim and tidy up the roads and also making more examples of particularly the people who discard litter out of their car windows, I think that would be a, a go a long way to help and um, you know to, to create a culture whereby people will be deterred and both incentivized to to look after their neighbourhoods. Declan, yeah, you're absolutely right, but we'll have to catch them first, chucking it out of the car window, and that's never the easy bit. Uh, so it's getting the behavioural change so they don't do it in the first place is the big thing. And, and then maybe, as you say, engaging communities to help support the cleanup uh, and, and keep their, their villages and roads tidy. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Uh, that was very helpful this morning. We're, we're going to be cut off very shortly now from broadcasting, so we finished this section of the meeting just in time. So I want to thank you very much, Tim, Fraser, Jonathan and Mark, for joining us here this morning. Okay, then. Uh, thanks very thank much, Chair. Thank you, Chair. members. Bye-bye now. Okay, members. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Take care now. Bye bye. Um, I'm going to move on very swiftly, and hopefully, we'll get finished uh, as much as possible before broadcasting has to uh, cut us off. Right. Item number seven is a written briefing statutory instrument, the Climate and Energy Revocation EU Exit Regulation 2021. The papers are pitched. 425 year packs. This is a UK wide regulation being drafted by BEIS with the intention of laying them in Parliament today and are subject to an agro resolution. The committee is asked to indicate its content for the dear minister to give consent for a UK minister to lay the statute instrument in the UK Parliament. The committee is asked to write in any comments or issues it wishes to draw to the attention of the minister. Consent will also be required from the Department of the Economy in respect of EU energy and governance regulations that this SI proposes to revoke. Minister Trevelyan, Minister Trevelyan has written separately to Minister Dodds in this regard. Although this SI, SI may have elements which cover both DFE and dear responsibilities, the whole pr- purpose of this SI is to deactivate redundant legislation. The listed redundant legislation within the SA being revoked has no crossover responsibility between DFE and DERA. The DERA relevant legislation within this SA being revoked has no material effect outside of DERA and does not cut across DFE responsibility. Um, uh, if members have any questions, we have John and Richard, John, Early and Richard Coy in standby. Or, have you any questions? No? Okay. Okay, 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 okay. If members are content that we note the SA using the agreed form of words as previously agreed by committee. Okay, okay. Okay, uh, item eight is uh, Department Briefing Marine Plan. Uh, the, the briefings on page 449. I want to invite members, there's a statute obligation to prepare a marine plan for inshore and offshore regions on the Marine Act 2013 and Marine and Coastal Access Act 2009. In March 2011, the Executive adopted a UK Marine Policy Statement and doing so committed the Executive to a Northern Ireland Marine Plan. The UK's government's aim is to have marine plans in place for the whole UK marine area by 2021. Therefore, it has been kept informed of the progress made by DERA. The purpose of the marine plan is set out in the departmental briefing papers and, I'll give them, and members will have a chance to look over those in their packs. Um, um, if members are okay, if you have any questions, can you inform to Stella by the close of play today? Is that okay? And I remember that we seek updates on the progress of the second version of Marine Plan, which is planned to be with the Minister this month's consideration. Okay. Okay, item nine then is the Department of Written Briefing EU Exit Transition Update. Uh, the written update is at page 456 here at PAC. The information uh, as provided to the committee is up to date as of the 24th of February, and with the exception of point nine, which, is up to, which was updated to the 3rd of March. And I, again, I asked members if I had any questions on the update to Stella by the close of play today. Okay? Okay, let's move on now to item 12, actually, which is any other business. Uh, many of members have any other business, do they? Okay. Right. The next, the next meeting will take place this day week at 10 a.m. and it'll be a virtual meeting streamed on the Wem Assembly website. And folks, have a very safe week and I hope to see you across the chamber next week and if not, at this virtual meeting next week. So we're just going to adjourn. Thank you, folks. Thanks very much. Take care.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 